Okay, well, hello everyone. Uh, it's nice to be back after our summer break to welcome everybody to the webinar experience again uh, with the Hypospadias Masterclass Series. This is session nine, and we're so glad that you're joining us. Those of you who are you know, participating live now, and then those of you who are going to be watching the recorded session of this too, welcome to everybody. We'll put the screen up and start. So as you know, we've been doing these classes basically once a month for over a year, trying to touch on various topics. You didn't restart our thing. I did, it just went to the end. There okay, so here we are. That's at the beginning. You know us, Dr. Sodgrass, Dr. Bush at our Hypospadia Specialty Center. And here's today's session. Does giving preoperative testosterone improve the outcomes of hypospadia surgery? I think our views are pretty well known on that, and, and we're going to just give a brief overview of why we came to the decisions that we've come to. But to be fair, we've also invited Luis to you know, give a different perspective and a, a bigger overview from his research and literature review and all of that. So I think it'll be a really nice session to get a broad spectrum of thoughts on this, you know, important question. So the first reported use of preoperative testosterone was by Dr. Culp at the Mayo Clinic now many decades ago. Yeah, in the 50s. So he recommended testosterone use after a patient came there to the Mayo Clinic having failed you know, three prior surgeries. And he took one look at it and said, well, that's so obvious. The whole reason that these surgeries aren't working is because the penis is too small. Let's give some testosterone. That's the first reference we've been able to find right. in the literature about why it was used in the first place. Yeah. And, and so it was also after that many years before anybody else reported on giving it. And these most of the reports in the literature until recent times have basically just said, we gave testosterone mostly for proximal hypospadias for boys who had this quote, small appearing penis. And the, the amount of testosterone that's been given, you know, after initially Culp used topical ointment, but th then there was a swing over to um, injections, oral. right, because you could control the dose better. But the outcome that everybody reported was that the penis got bigger, okay? And our view about that is that, you know, you, you can also make the penis bigger just by wearing loops, and we all do that. So the real question is, do hormones improve the outcome of surgery? We know they'll make the penis better, but does bigger... Uh, bigger but does making the penis bigger translate into reducing outcomes? And that all started in our practice because of this observation that we made over 15 years ago, I think, that back when I was doing more proximal tips and lots of distal tips, I noticed that I was having more glands dehiscence in the proximals than in the distals despite the fact that the surgical procedure was in many ways the same, the glands plastic was, was exactly the same. the same. You were using the exact same sutures in the exact same manner in distals and in proximal tips. That didn't change at all. And yet the outcomes were different in terms of at least different enough to be statistically significant. Right. And so looking at that, obviously the first question we had is, well, if it's the same surgeon using the same technique with the same sutures, I bet it could be due to a difference in the size of the glands. And so Dr. Bush, and I, I think it was um, Dan DeHusta, you know, set up a study at our center where they measured glands with the boys coming in for newborn cirques and boys with distal hypospadias and boys with proximal hypospadias. And, and you see there was a statistically significant difference in size, right? That's exactly right. So then that brought up the next question. Okay, fine. We see there's a difference in size in distals versus proximals. So now let's just try to make the smaller glands in proximals 
the same size as it is in distals. So that really opened our eyes to objectively measuring things and having an objective outcome to achieve so that we could hopefully make an impact on our glands dehiscence rates. Right. And so not only an objective outcome, but an objective criteria of who got the testosterone instead of just looking at it. Now, I, I had been in that camp before, but prior to us starting this, I did like everyone else. I examined a kid and said, I think he needs testosterone. It's, we don't show it on the slide, but I can tell you that when we started measuring it, my use of testosterone doubled. Yeah, doubled. So that's how inaccurate your eyes are. So, so we segregated them into these two groups. Those who had a gland size less than 14 um, got testosterone and those that had it 14 or bigger did not get testosterone. And so that's how we set it up. And then we gave that testosterone until the penis got bigger. So we gave a dose and then we brought them back and measured the glands. And then we gave another dose and, to, and brought them back and measured the glands. We escalated the dose when well, it we wasn't didn't getting there. Not at first. We originally gave the standard parenteral three, you know, 25 milligrams per kilogram. Two kind per of, kilo. Or, yeah, two per kilo per dose. Right. Just like is reported throughout the literature. And what we found at the time of surgery was that some of those kids had grown, even grown well beyond the, the required 14 millimeters and others hadn't really budged at yeah. all and yeah. still remained significantly below. So yeah, that's so when we went to try. the escalating dose protocol so that we really could make sure that we achieved our desired outcome in size. Right. And so then once we had that, so here's our two cohorts. Now they're the same after the testosterone therapy. All of the gland sizes are the same in the two groups. Then I did the surgery. And those who needed the testosterone to achieve that size of glands still had a much higher complication rate. So testosterone did increase the gland size. But our hypothesis that that would correlate to improved outcomes did not prove to be correct. So, and what we also saw, what she just mentioned to you, was there was our objective to take the glands less than 14 and make it 14 or bigger. And so we started out and, you know, like everyone, we gave two milligrams per kilo with a plan two or three doses. But we were now measuring them when they came back. And we found that some of them were 14 millimeters or greater with just one dose. And so then they didn't need a second and a third dose. But others, especially those with proximal hypospadias, required even higher doses than we had previously been giving in order to achieve even just that glance width of 14. So the, the number of doses didn't result in growth to the glands. It was actually the amount of testosterone that made the difference in terms of the um, glands width growth. That's exactly right. The, when we first started, we gave the two milligrams per kilo for two or three injections, just like Dr. Bush just said, and the, we measured them and they weren't there yet. And so then we started increasing the dose and and we had to keep increasing the dose in some of them so you know there was androgen resistance in that group now fortunately these aren't any of our patients they're patients who came to us from elsewhere but i think it's really important to point out that these are all boys that are less than 10 some of whom had some very significant side effects here you have penises that clearly don't look right on three and four year old boys. You have a prepubertal patient who has a beard underneath there. Yeah, that boy's also, he was three or four years old. And look at that big husky jaw and everything. And unfortunately, this pubic hair doesn't go away. No, well, the chin hair either. So, you know, these are boys, I don't know what dose they got, but I'm going to guess that this was similar to our experience that 
probably these doctors weren't measuring, but they were, they kept giving dose of testosterone and maybe also maybe escalated the dose too, because they weren't seeing an effect. We or they got topical, which can be absorbed at variable rates, depending on where the parent touches and, and how much they, they put, put on. on. So, you know, it's, it's hard to know how this happened, but the fact that it does happen and is irreversible and causes changes that are going to be noted by any caretakers, et cetera, I think is something we have to consider. We did improve our glands dehiscence problem. We did do that. And the slide shows how that we've told this story before that it happened that after she told me the data you know, that what we had found that the testosterone wasn't working. I happened to go to Japan and saw Subaru Tanakazi and um, Yoshina, uh, uh, Kaaru Oshina, you know, do surgery in boys with proximal hypospadias. And they did much more glands dissection than I did. They don't use testosterone They either. don't use testosterone. Yeah, even though, again, the, their Asian patients also have small glands. So they did a more extensive glands wings dissection and we started doing the same thing. And she will tell you that as soon as we start doing that, gland size dropped out of our uh, logistic regression as yeah. a risk factor for complications. Not as soon as, it took many years okay. of data, but, but yeah, now it, it doesn't matter in our database in terms of the exact width, whereas before it clearly did. So it was actually a technical change in the way we did surgery that turned out to be way more important than growing the penis or not growing the penis, which had been our original thought. And that fits into our overall um, emphasis in this and other lectures that we give that most of the problems that we see from hypospatial repair are due to technical errors, things that we as surgeons could do better. And what was interesting, I, I happened to come across an article by John Duckett, uh, and he had a picture of his plans wings dissection, and it was like this. And I started laughing because that's not the way I was taught. So if you train with John Duckett, you may have had less plans dehiscence than I did from my training. And again, it just goes to the story that we have to look at each step of surgeries and how we do each component of it to get the best results. So we got better with glands dehiscence and quit using testosterone. It was so ironic. And, and the point is that, you know, these complications, we have to look at our work and not blame the patient. Or in our case now, we don't blame the small glands anymore. Yeah. It was so interesting. So now we really have come to the conclusion that better surgery is what gives us better results. And since that time, we've not used preoperative testosterone at all. At all. So is this the right choice? There's no doubt that when we have a very small glance, technically it's a more demanding surgery that we have to do. I mean, a millimeter here or there is much different in a 15 millimeter glance than it is in a nine millimeter glance when it comes to the dissection. So we don't know for certain if we're making the right choice when it comes to our decision-making besides the data that we just showed you, we also have tried to incorporate some animal study data that suggests that there's some impacts that hormones can have on wound healing. And so for many reasons, we haven't gone back to using testosterone. We thought this was the perfect opportunity to have somebody who has thought very carefully about this question and has published extensively on hypospadias and testosterone use in it to have a little bit of a lively discussion, we hope, <laughs> about his use of it and, and what the literature shows. So we're gonna stop sharing our screen with you right now and introduce Dr. Braga to you. Thank you, Nicole and Warren. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with uh, both of you and then um, share my views can you see the, the slides in here? Yes, you're good. Yes, so um, 
the topic that we we're going to talk about is preoperative uh, androgen stimulation, and um, and there is a reason why we're not calling it like testosterone or uh, hormonal stimulation because the agent will vary. So the most important thing that um, I would like to start talking will be the outline. So we we're going to discuss a little bit about what does it actually mean when someone says uh, give testosterone, the effects that a uh, um, Warren, Dr. Snodgrass, and Dr. Bush has, have already uh, uh, discussed and touched upon um, uh, some surveys, and I put one here from this Hypospadias International Society survey, uh, the controversy in the literature, um, then a few things that, um, that Nicole explained well, but why sometimes the studies um, or the conclusion of these studies cannot be completely trusted because there are some limitations in, in their methodology or in the, the way they analyze the results. Uh, the results from some systematic reviews, which is also problematic in this field because if the quality of the study or if the study has a, a flaw, then the outcome will be uh, the same way. You're not able to get water and make it a wine from a systematic review. And um, at the end, I, I still do selectively use testosterone and I will explain the rationale for that. So. The main thing is what does it actually mean to use testosterone? So when you ask this question, what type of hormonal treatment do you use to make the penis bigger in hypospadias patients with a small penis? So then you have a different agent, what dose, or what age? And then um, the role of testosterone therapy in hypospadias, if there is uh, one in distal hypospadias, and um, based on what... Uh, um, Dr. Snodgrass and Dr. Bush mentioned probably not, and then the role in proximal ones as well. So uh, 10 years ago, we, the intent, we published this systematic review uh, in the Journal of Urology, and the main um, like purpose of this, that review was not to do a meta-analysis or to actually uh, detect if there was a beneficial effect for testosterone or not. The main purpose was to check uh, and then raise awareness to see what we are doing and exactly what uh, um, Dr. Bush and Dr. Uh, Snodgrass mentioned, there is, a, there is a variability of the doses, uh, the intervals, the agents, and the timing uh, between the last testosterone shot and the surgery. As you see here, um, they use two milligram per kilogram per dose, like I do, but some people will use 25 milligram per dose. But again, this depends on the child's weight. We know that Europeans will end up way, uh, operating on children at a later age. In Canada, us as well, because of the wait times. In the US, the age, the timing for hypospadias is much younger, uh, much, much earlier. So some will use like the endocrinologist. They, they try to measure this based on the body surface. And others may use even um, 100 milligrams per uh, square meter. So... Obviously, if you're going to compare results from studies, if you didn't get the same dose, uh, you're, you're difficult to assess the side effects or the, or the effect if it increased with one dose, the results after two doses, et cetera. Not even saying, like Nicole mentioned, if you're using a topical uh, application or an uh, intramuscular one. Um, in terms of um, what we noticed was exactly what happened, that the indication to use testosterone is subjective. So some were using like the first description for redo uh, surgery. Others were using for uh, penises less than 25 millimeters. Um, but um, it, it, is, it is subjective. At least this article mentioned uh, a length for the penis uh, at which uh, below that they would um, um, you know, employ testosterone. So we concluded that um, at least from those reports, uh, we'll get to the side effects, but they did not observe any harm using preoperative testosterone for hypospadias. And uh, most uh, uh, studies there were um, getting one to three doses. Um, the interval was different. Some people were doing like three, four weeks. The agents, some use HCG, uh, others use the depot testosterone others like you know, dehydrotestosterone and others even just topical testosterone. So the timing to the surgery, some were um, applying testosterone and then um, booking the surgery a week after, others maybe three months later, others a, a month after. So all this will create variability and that's what we call clinical heterogeneity. So once you have that, even though 
Uh, you can do a systematic review and try to plot that into one uh, single uh, graph. But if the studies are different, then you're not supposed to combine these outcomes and you should not trust the results that are coming out of it. Um, in terms of the effects, um, we try to look at this when we, one of my residents reviewed the literature. Uh, what is being well known about testosterone is, is, is that it increased the penile size. Like, you no, know, the glands is going to be bigger, the shaft gets more robust, uh, increase also penile or penis vascularization. Um, so, those photos that um, Dr. Bush and Dr. Snodgrass mentioned, and they have a unique experience. So uh, uh, there is nobody that has higher or uh, more experience in hypospadias and difficult case and uh, referred cases for, his, uh, for their hypospadias center. But according to some studies, where they observed increased in systolic blood pressure, aggressive behavior, um, and then uh, presence of pubic hair and penile hyperpigmentation. But uh, from those reviews and those articles, they said that this effect was temporary. Um, in my patients, we, we, we have, and I will show um, the number of patients with testosterone probably at this point will be around more than 200 patients. And uh, we haven't seen a bit of a hyperpigmentation that has improved over uh, time because we follow those patients prospectively. Um, I've never observed any pubic hair to that extent as shown by Warren's and Nicole's uh, photos, but we have seen you know, that, uh, that small um, uh, hair that you can see before it's like light and, and, and then becomes a little bit darker. Uh, but then uh, after a few um, months or years of post-operative follow-up, uh, we don't uh, notice them anymore. Uh, in terms of um, long-term effects, um, when we look at the literature, most problems with testosterone were observed in patients that had um, delayed puberty and then the, or patients with growth um, um, retardation that in terms of uh, testosterone was given to uh, gain height. And um, so these patients had much higher doses for a longer period of time. And then there, it's questionable uh, in terms of the uh, long-term penile size a shorter height because this would uh, compromise or interfere with the bone maturation. So the main question and what we're trying to answer, as Nicole mentioned, uh, from experimental studies, uh, they have shown that uh, testosterone would be associated in animal studies uh, with impaired wound healing, and this then therefore could increase the complication rates. So um, how this um, started, um, first, I think we, we went in the literature and we found like two to three surveys. There was one in Africa, but I brought this one because it relates a little bit more to what we're doing in North America. So this was an, a survey based on the AAP. Uh, the only or the main limitation was that it was very low number of respondents, only 27. And... Um, uh, the indications, the authors concluded that they were using testosterone for proximal hypospadias. Again, uh, those with the small glands or small appearing penises, uh, then the subjectivity is there, and then those with a reduced urethroplate. According to this survey that was conducted three years ago in the Hypospadias International Society, we had a high uh, response rate and with almost uh, 300 respondents. And what was interesting that um, in keeping with what uh, Dr. Bush and Dr. Uh, Snodgrass are saying, the majority, 56%, were not using preoperative testosterone for hypospadias repair. Um, uh, again, interestingly, uh, there is no criteria for testosterone. Or if there is this criteria, the way I understand selectively is subjectively, because the, the objective criteria was not there. So, but we try to... Um, try to establish some objectivity and mention a uh, glands width less than 12 millimeters for all cases, only for distal, only for proximals less than 14. And we got it a little bit of a distribution as you can see in the, in the legend above. So in terms of the agent, as mentioned from the systematic review and other studies, uh, the two main um, types of testosterone were testosterone depot uh, IM, which is used uh, uh, throughout North America, and mainly South American and Europeans that they prefer the gel because it's available and not being available in North America for our use. Uh, in regards to the number of doses, as was mentioned, 
and we'll talk later about a recent paper done by the uh, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. But uh, the majority of respondents, 44%, use three doses. And, um, uh, but it's important to see here that more than 30%, maybe one third, are using other types, maybe more than that. And maybe this could lead to uh, uh, potential side effects. Uh, in regards to the interval between the doses, it also varies. 50% uh, of the respondents uh, use usually a month between uh, the doses, uh, but uh, up to 26% will use different intervals. And finally, uh, what we want to know, because uh, some studies have shown that it does matter uh, the time between the surgery and the last dose, and you can have higher complications if you don't wait uh, long enough. My concern with waiting long enough that you may, in my experience, you may uh, lose the effect um, caused by testosterone in increasing the penile vascularity or the size of the glands penis, et cetera. But uh, according to this survey of almost 300 people, uh, most participants, 43% said that they wait a month uh, between the last shot of testosterone and the surgery. So how this controversy initiated uh, regarding testosterone and worse outcomes after hypospadias repair. So it started in Lyon, France with a group from Pierre Morican. Uh, they published um, two papers. And uh, one of the main things about those papers was that a preoperative testosterone was uh, found to have or to be associated with higher complication rates. Um, when uh, one goes back to analyze the paper in terms of the methods, we could see that a testosterone had been given to cases with more severe types of hypospadias. So the severe phenotype, it is uh, known to be associated with worse outcomes. So even though this is there uh, as a confounding fact, but uh, the conclusion was that a testosterone was associated with more complications. That is a fact, it was shown, but we have to look into a, um, or take into account as well what type of patients were receiving that uh, testosterone? Were they patients that had um, like favorable uh, type of hypospadias or those who had probably very severe degree of curvature, hypoplasia of the urethral plate, uh, um, like even corporal, corporal disproportion, et cetera, et cetera. So I put it here at uh, this that uh, if you go into the literature in the California because they are um, they struggle with uh, uh, fires more recently. Uh, the fire department in the California um, did a survey in the past about trying to analyze uh, the, the records to see how much damage uh, the, the, these fires, wildfires were causing. And then they tried to look at the, um, how the fire engines would respond to the blaze. And they, to their surprise, they found a strong correlation between the amount of fire damage and the number of fire trucks. And the conclusion, obviously, of a preliminary report that never went, uh, uh, never went forward, because they concluded the more fire engines that you send uh, to the areas that are where the fire is, the more damage they cause. Obviously, there is an association because of confounding, not a true association and cause and effect. Could that be the case for hypospadias? Um, and uh, testosterone stimulation. So again, this I'll not spend much time, but uh, as Dr. Bush and Snod Grass mentioned, uh, they have demonstrated um, very elegantly and nicely that uh, they did not observe any reduction in erythroplastic complication, even when they had this uh, objective criteria to um, start testosterone uh, stimulation for patients. Then this was uh, measurement objectively before the surgery and having the glands width less than 14 millimeters. Uh, as they could not see any benefit um, from a giving testosterone, so they concluded uh, or they thought that it would not be necessary because of the potential side effects. Uh, if you don't need to uh, give something, then why, why do it? Um, so we also try to look um, based on their recommendations to give testosterone for those who had a, a smaller gland size. Uh, we look at our own data out of 390 patients. This was a few years back when we still do a tubularizing size plate for all types of hypospadias, um, mainly those with mid-shaft and proximal defects. I'm not talking about those with penoscrotal, scrotal, and perineal hypospadias. So in that cohort, we gave testosterone to 26% of patients. 
Um, and as you can see here, the complication uh, tends to increase as um, the defect or the phenotype of hypospadias becomes more severe. So we had 90% of complications for distal cases, 17% for mid shaft and almost 30% for the proximal cases. Um, and we tried to do an analysis, trying to look at uh, uh, risk factors and the outcome. And one thing that we thought uh, to do because uh, most of the studies were not doing that is that we tried to group factors that we thought could be correlated to each other uh, to try to take the interaction and the confounding effect of those factors. So we decided to group testosterone with glands width because as we mentioned before, if the glands was small, according to all the papers, those were the cases were more likely to receive testosterone. So we also tried to group meator location and ventral curvature for the same reason, because those who have proximal hypospadias have a higher chance to have curvature greater than 30 degrees. And then we also group those with glands groove uh, in terms of no, sh no uh, shallow plate or no groove at all with those with a uh, sulcus or a deep groove that we define as being able to tubularize over an eight French catheter uh, with the quality of the spongiosum. Uh, patients that had very poor spongiosum or those with a robust one. And when we look at this into a multivariable analysis, what we found was that uh, was more related to the quality of the erythroplate. This is a long discussion that Warren and uh, Nicole um, um, probably have different views on that, but other people have shown or have had difficulty um, in terms of uh, better outcomes with patients that have this kind of um, a uh, different phenotype or a more a uh, difficult uh, um, a presentation of hypospadias. And then we thought that this was associated with higher complication rates, not uh, preoperative testosterone, not uh, the location of the meatus in these cases. And the reason for that is that uh, those cases are all related in the shaft of the penis. And probably uh, if you do a good repair and uh, patients with good vascularization, good quality of uh, uh, tissues, this wouldn't affect the outcome. Um, so, uh, in conclusion, we thought that, uh, again, testosterone was not the culprit here, that uh, the, uh, the bad factor associated with poor outcomes, but rather uh, intrinsic phenotypic uh, characteristics related to the, the severity of the case. And this glands groove or the quality of the erythroplate could be a surrogate for that. And this would be more associated with complications um, after tip repair. So, um, after almost uh, eight years, we decided to look at the studies because uh, initially in 2012, 2011, we could only find four to five studies. And then now we're able to identify 14 to 15 studies. And this, uh, it's interesting, one of our uh, residents showed that uh, we, when we separated those studies comparing testosterone, no testosterone, and the outcome would be complications post hypospadias repair, we observed, as you can see in the point estimate here, that um, when uh, no testosterone uh, was there, so patients had a better outcome. Um, okay, so um, what what is the what is the um, what is the problem with this? The problem is that um, uh, there is a severe, or how can I say, there is a selection bias because again, patients who had more severe disease were the ones that were getting or more likely to get testosterone. When we look at the uh, randomized trials, um, there was no effect of testosterone. The, the point estimate was crossing the, the line of no effect. And uh, this is um, important because the only difference between a randomized control study and an observation study is that uh, we are trying to minimize uh, confounding effect or selection bias because the decision to give or not give testosterone is not made by the surgeon or the caregiver or anybody else. It's, it's being made uh, randomly. And this would take that effect away that we could not only select to give testosterone to those who had uh, like a penis growth hypospadias or severe curvature, et cetera, or a very small penis. So uh, it's interesting. We wrote about this in the Juno Pediatric Urology, uh, why non-randomized studies may mislead and come up with conclusions that may be even uh, contradictory to what makes sense clinically, because uh, many, many times there is a convenient sampling. So people are selecting uh, patients that are gonna be included in the studies or 
there is a referral bias or a referral pattern to that um, uh, center um, or um, hypospadias center. And therefore they may get more difficult patients versus those that are, have a more favorable outcome. Again, the selection bias just based on meator location or ventral curvature or size of the penis. So testosterone may not be given um, um, equally to both groups. And then if you don't have those groups starting with the same baseline um, characteristics at the beginning, the results may be different, but only because they started in a different way, not because that factor is the one causing and explaining the difference. Uh, the other thing that is important, again, we've seen from the survey and also from the systematic review is the lack of standardized protocols. So testosterone is, is given differently. Uh, so the results from Europe may have different results than North American because uh, the dose of the, 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 the medication or the testosterone is different, the interval, and even um, how many doses they got it. Uh, and finally, uh, about reporting bias and observer bias or measurement bias in a way that are ascertainment bias because um, it is difficult to um, judge the results. So sometimes if you tell parents that to look for um, children that are going to be more aggressive because they are taking that drug, they be more inclined to see that if someone is cranky, that they, they are becoming more aggressive and this and that, because this is done not in a uh, blind way, but more uh, knowing what to expect. And if you have a, a preconceived uh, um, thoughts about something, you may be more likely to report that something is related to that versus not. So um, I think I would like to say about selection bias that the severity of hypospadias as shown in our studies and many others, uh, the group from Atlanta has done a nice study about uh, the GMS score and showing that according to that score, uh, the higher the score, the more likely you are to have complications. So um, we know that the very severe case like perineal case have a higher complication than a distal hypospadias. So the more proximal the defect, the higher the complication rate. So whenever doing studies with high uh, testosterone, this has need to be adjusted. Otherwise your results may be confounded by that. Proximal cases being more likely to have small penises. Uh, Warren showed that, uh, that the glands was three millimeters smaller uh, than in those with distal cases. So they may be more likely to receive testosterone by those who use testosterone indication as the size of the penis. So therefore, the only way to reduce selection bias, not eliminate, but reduce, is with randomization. And that's why we saw the difference in the systematic review uh, between the results um, uh, produced by observation studies versus those produced by randomized controlled trials. So another paper uh, adding to the controversy, this is from Chicago. They did not find any harm effect of using testosterone and saw that the odds ratio for the all patients was not different from those using or without testosterone, saying that uh, uh, this was not um, the main factor driving the complication, but there were other issues. Could be surgical technique like Warren and uh, Nicole Bush uh, pointed out, yes, but could be also uh, factors related to the intrinsic biology of the tissues or the phenotype of the hypospadias. Um, finally, I thought that this study was well done by the group of Chris Long in, in Philadelphia. They look at almost 600 consecutive patients where they're able to obtain glands with measurements. And uh, in that uh, um, uh, cohort, 43% received testosterone. One thing that they look at was patients who had testosterone versus those with, that did not receive testosterone had a difference of two millimeters. 16 millimeters for those with testosterone, 14 millimeters for those who did not receive testosterone at surgery. And um, in summary, what they look at this, that the effect of testosterone was more pronounced in patients with distal hypospadias versus those with proximal ones. And this may refer what um, uh, Nicole and Warren were mentioned that sometimes patients with severe form of hypospadias may have some degree of partial androgenic sensitivity or other issues. Um, one thing that was interesting is that this has not been shown by other papers, is that if uh, obviously no testosterone, you don't increase the gland size, but with one dose, they observe two millimeters increase. And then if you, gave two, uh, if you give two doses, you can get a, a, an increase uh, of uh, up to four millimeters. So there was a kind of a dose response uh, mechanism um, that uh, if you increase the dose, you'd get a uh, um, higher uh, gland size. And finally, uh, another interesting factor 
uh, that could be good and bad because if the results are um, are supposed to last uh, in in this paper, they noticed that even two years after surgery, the gland size was equal for both groups, those with testosterone versus no testosterone. So if that effect of testosterone is going to last uh, for the beneficial effect, which is increasing the gland size, it may also last for side effects. We don't know yet. Uh, but like I said, yeah, at least in hypospadias, uh, what has been reviewed and documented in the literature that these uh, results of uh, potential side effects have not been documented uh, at the longer follow-up. So um, what I, I, I do at McMaster Children's Hospital, I have been using testosterone for glands with less than 14 millimeters. We're still doing this prospective study as Dr. Bush and Dr. Snodgrass know, um, we do sample size calculation and because to detect a small difference, you need a lot of patients. So that's why we have been doing this study for a long time. And I also like to use testosterone when I have a very flat glands groove. So there is no sulcus, um, there is no dimple. Um, I understand and um, I have had these discussions in the past with both of them that they uh, will recommend making the incision, uh, deep proper incision in the glands and this will allow them to tubularize uh, the plate. Um, we believe we do those incisions and I'll show that uh, in those cases I prefer to uh, cover that uh, large incision or deep incision with an uh, inlay dorsal graft. But I, I do like to have more of those strips on each side of the incised plate bigger and I can get that when I, I have the patient um, with testosterone because then my, my glands width becomes bigger and I believe that it makes tubularization easier. Um, obviously not scientifically proven yet. Uh, in proximal hypospadias, I have been using for all cases only before the first stage, uh, not during the second stage where we do the proper urethroplasty. So uh, all the concerns about testosterone affecting wound healing uh, or erythroplastic complications because we're not using during or before the second stage, that would not hold true. Um, the reason why uh, I use for the first stage or before the first stage, I will explain in a, in a few slides. So I use three shots uh, initially, but I see those patients to see if they respond. And when they get to a size of 14 to 15 millimeters, obviously you don't need to give a third one if you already obtained that response. Um, the three weeks apart and the surgery is done four weeks after the last shot, depot testosterone and two milligrams per kilogram. So my indications for testosterone in distal cases are with shallow, there is no, and then very narrow urethral plate, there is just like nothing there. So I thought that I, I, would, I would like to increase my, my blood supply, my tissues, because um, when I open up, I'm able to achieve this um, um, wide urethral plate that can be tubularized. And I have a good glance that I, I as Warren is, and, and Nicole pay attention, I think it's important to have glands fusion below the urethral meatus to call this a successful uh, outcome. Uh, in another example of distal cases, this is a case that I find very challenging. Um, uh, a child or a baby with a, an abundant super pubic fat pad, even circumcisions in those patients are challenging. So in hypospadias, I, I find that I, I know and I get the point that Dr. Bush and it's not as mentioned that you can use uh, magnifying loops or glasses to increase the tissues that you're working with. But I find that if I can have the, the penis stick out more so that I can even put my coband or my tegaderm dressing uh, post-operative to reduce hematoma or any complications it will be better. And you see, there is no uh, sulcus or anything like that. And I find that even if I go wide to mark my urethral plate incision, I find that this becomes challenging. So I, I, in those cases, I find testosterone can be helpful. Uh, in regards to the rationale for testosterone stimulation in proximal cases, um, I believe that uh, it has helped me to perform the erection test uh, after I do the ventral corporotomy. So there, there is no leak. Um, the other way to do that is as um, mentioned or uh, taught by popularized by Snodgrass and, and Bush uh, that you can use the triangle, Bush triangle to measure the distance. Uh, but sometimes it's nice to be able to visualize uh, that the, the penis is completely straight. I do believe that uh, you can have a better uh, harvest area 
the, 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 the dorsal hood becomes larger and more vascularized and then allows you to harvest a very nice uh, uh, graft, increase the penile uh, uh, skin size. And uh, so I think it does facilitate skin closure in patients with ventral skin deficiency because I have more uh, tissue to work with. And sometimes in those patients, the skin may get devascularized. So with testosterone, this does not happen. We haven't had any issues with uh, uh, skin ischemia or problems with uh, dehesis. And then also we, we believe that um, you have a more vascularized uh, corpora in terms of the bed for the graft. Uh, I know that uh, um, Warren Snodgrass and Nicole Bush mentioned that you can have contraction of those grafts if you put the, or place the graft on top of the incision. Um, hasn't been, maybe was the case in those 5%, but uh, um, the contraction has been low and stable uh, out of now almost more than 100 cases and the uh, contraction of grafts has been around 6%. And one other issue, the final one, is that uh, you can even use a darter's flap. Um, according to systematic reviews and, and results from uh, individual studies, the, the tunica vaginalis flap has shown to have superior results in terms of reducing the retrocutaneous fistula. But if you have a, um, a robust or well vascularized darters, I think this can be equivalent uh, to a tunica vaginalis flap. So therefore, there are darters and darters. So this is to show uh, some examples of what I said direction test post-corporotomy. So uh, you're able to do it because I believe that we're just incising the outer layer of the tunic albuginia of the corpora. Um, and then this uh, allows a confidence that uh, the maneuvers that we have used to do the erection test, uh, uh, the correction of the curvature um, are fine. And then you can proceed to the urethroplasty without any concerns. Um, in case like that, so the skin gets very redundant and vascular. So it is um, uh, easy and comfortable to harvest uh, um, the prepucial graft in these circumstances. Um, uh, a quick trick uh, for you to enlarge or, or um, uh, increase the length of the, the graft, instead of just using this uh, part as the graft, you can only have like four or five centimeters, but if you go around like this, keeping the same uh, width, you're able to get six to seven centimeters. Uh, in patients who have like you no know, scrotal um, defects or even perineal ones to get to the tip of the glands, as shown here, um, it can cover the whole index. My, my fingers are not very long, but uh, it's somehow uh, uh, seven centimeters. And um, this is to show uh, the thickness and how vascularized the darter's flap can be in patients who have had testosterone stimulation. So you're not only able to, I do like, uh, sometimes to do a buttonhole because this helps the penis um, uh, pulls a little bit backwards and let the penis have this more um, a straight position. Uh, but also you can do what we will comment here, which is the double darters. Uh, and according to some studies, this has even shown to reduce the, the incidence of uh, fistulous post repair. So you can put one graft uh, here in the superior part and the other one like that. And um, uh, they will overlap and this um, can be as thick as a tunica vaginalis flap. Again, um, not to be done in all the cases, but it creates you an, an alternative if you don't want to violate the, 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 um, the scrotum to pull the testicle up. Sometimes patients have had orchidopexis and uh, this is not available. So uh, I think it's an alternative that is there and you, with the testosterone makes uh, much easier and much more robust. If no testosterone, it's not possible to achieve what I just showed to you guys here. So at the end, uh, we are all trying to achieve um, a successful outcomes for this most severe type of hypospadias. Um, and um, I believe like this um, way, uh, the penis, uh, the graft the taking well, it's almost like, you know, 80% of the second stage going well. If you have a good graft that has already laid there on the tissue, then the tubularization following the technical principles like uh, um, Dr. Snodgrass and Bush mentioned, I think you should expect to have to, a long um, successful outcomes. Thank you very much. And um, we're open for a lively discussion with both. Um, I think at the end of the day, not to be a cliche, but uh, um, this is done in other um, uh, fields of medicine. We do need uh, uh, larger studies with um, you know, uh, more number of patients and uh, in a controlled fashion to really be able to answer this, this question once for all. 
uh, because just to extrapolate what we've seen in animals, there are so many other uh, factors that can interfere with the, the outcome um, and testosterone being one of them. Um, so um, that's why I think um, uh, the way to answer this will be to, through a randomized control trial. And in North America, it becomes more difficult because um, um, research ethics board will not allow um, children to receive a placebo injection so if we only have IM injections for testosterone, it's going to be difficult to conduct such a study in, in North America, uh, but maybe in South America or in Europe where they have the cream, as long as we can prove through some uh, lab work or blood work that the concentration is achieved to a certain level, then this could be uh, uh, a good alternative to answer once for all this question. Thank you very much. Can we talk? We can talk now. Thanks, everyone. Luis, that was fabulous. It was such a great review of the literature that's out there. And I'm sure that um, lots of folks have questions. We're inviting you guys to place your questions either on the question and answer section, or you can place it on the chat where um, everyone can put the chat box up and, and then it's easier for some of us to all be able to see the questions. So first, I'm going to go over to the question and answer. Um, segment and ask a few questions that are there. So one of the questions is um, the need for more dose of testosterone in proximal hypospadias, was that associated with a, a, some type of a developmental sexual disorder? So Warren, I think you can answer that since that's, I think, more for us since we did escalate the dose. Yeah, I think the the issue is that most boys, even with severe hypospadias, do not really have a DSD, depending on how you define that. And today, in the past decade, there's been an increasing number of boys who've been diagnosed as 46XY um, under virulized males. And yet, when we evaluate those boys who have that diagnosis, they have a normal penile length. They have a, been a normal glands width. They have testicles and a scrotum. I'm, I'm not sure what defines under virilization. And we've not been able to find any such definition throughout the literature. Right. So it, just answering your question goes back to what Luis said earlier. You know, if you have a fuzzy definition, it's, you can't give a clear answer. So I, I don't know the answer to that. What I can answer though, what we do know for sure is today you can diagnose 5 alpha reductase deficiency quite accurately. And we have seen a number of boys with that diagnosis and they also have a broad phenotype from some that don't have hypospadias but have quite diminutive you know, genitalia. And then to the opposite end of the spectrum, uh, boys who have hypospadias, but th their phenotype otherwise, you would never guess that there was anything wrong at all with them. And the bottom line is we now have been able to get, we have one patient that we've treated with permission through the um, FDA. We have another patient that we are requesting permission from the FDA. And then we have two patients who are from out of the United States who we've treated with dihydrotestosterone um, who don't require approval from the FDA. And, and the, the growth that they get from giving dihydrotestosterone is dramatic and, and within six weeks, and it's dramatic. So that is not the subject of what we've been, but it, well, it is. I mean, we framed it in that way to incorporate that kind of answer, but when we were talking about it, we were talking about patients who don't have a diagnosed DSD. Well, and the fact of the matter is when you take a bunch of perineal hypospadias, the most severe forms that you get, and do kind of the state of the art testing for hormonal disturbances, as best we can tell, you can't find any abnormalities on the vast majority of these patients, except the very few with a known disorder like 5-alpha reductase or a known family that's a PAIS sort of family. So, and, and even amongst those with known diagnoses, 
an extraordinarily variable phenotype. So I think it's a really um, difficult question to answer to say, do they have a DSD? Not by most measurable circumstances. Luis, do you have a different point of view on that question? No, I, I agree. I, if Nicole allows me, I think you, you uh, touch on everything. I, I can just answer the, the second one because I was going to put a, this paper up and I apologize to the authors that I didn't do it. I, I forgot. Uh, it's a paper from Iran uh, that they did um, uh, because they're asking about it. So the question is how uh, does one measure in an objective way that the tissues are more vascularized by observer and luminescence? So this study uh, from Iran, they actually did uh, a control experiment comparing like um, a 27 patients or 18 patients versus 23 patients. So the numbers were very small, but at least they did biopsy of the foreskin in patients who had testosterone versus those who did not. And then they observed then from histology that uh, there was much more vascularization in the foreskin of those who um, uh, received testosterone and also less inflammation. So that's according to that study. So people have done that. Um, there is another study from um, uh, Brazil that has looked into this um, about the histology and even with uh, uh, estrogens as well. So which would be the opposite of, of, um, of testosterone. But uh, in my experience, we have seen it um, in a subjective way um, that the tissues, they become thicker, more robust, and um, uh, stronger after uh, uh, application of testosterone. We would agree that you see thickening. My concern for it is that I can see really thick skin sometimes where the dartos tissues and all of it is almost woody in appearance. And this can be very difficult to work with, um, sometimes even long periods after they've received testosterone. Fortunately, hyperbaric oxygen therapy seems to counteract some of that woody abnormal thickness that we can see to the tissues. And of course, you can see that just in folks who've failed many, many operations, regardless of whether or not they've seen, uh, they've had testosterone. But, you know, I think there's so much that we don't really know or understand about the impacts of hormones on tissues. And, and of course, that's going to be variable um, in different patient populations. So, that, you know, lots of interesting information that I think is out there that, that people who are interested in this topic or who are using testosterone could look into. I mean, there are ways you could measure the thickness of the skin, for instance. There are, you know, studies that could repeat the Iranian study looking at blood vessels and things along those lines, and then hopefully correlate them with ultimately outcomes, because that is the important thing that we're trying to measure. That, that's kind of the pity of this, I think, Luis, you touched on it, is that there's a lot of people using testosterone. There's very few people deriving any objective data from it. And, and so even short of a randomized trial, you know, if you just want to answer questions about changes in skin characteristics or other things like that, you know, if, if you don't begin to think about that and, and ask the questions, uh, there's so many areas where our knowledge could be improved with just, you know, setting up a simple study and doing observations repetitively. But ultimately, if we're going to get down to the sort of infrastructure and time and expense that it takes for randomized controlled trials. We have to model that not on this hypothesis of does testosterone, you know, cause harm or cause increased complications. It has to be, does it improve outcomes? Because there's absolutely no reason to make an intervention which could have potentially even lifelong implications for patients if it, unless it, you can truly show improvement. And I've unfortunately seen several abstracts and, and you know, things, presentations that have been coming down the pipes that show no testosterone doesn't hurt, but mm -hmm. that's not the question that we ask with an intervention, right? The question is, does it help? All right, so let's move along to another question on the question and answer. Have you seen after testosterone administration, 
a significant increase in glands diameter. Um, Luis, why don't you take that? Well, I think that that's that's the uh, again. There is a, a significant risk for complication. I think that was your study uh, in the beginning, a few years back, that you thought that, uh, again, at least you, you demonstrate that uh, patients that had uh, smaller glands had a higher complication rate. But then you explained really well that uh, you're able to modify the technique for glansplasty, and then you're, you were able to overcome that, that problem uh, without the need for testosterone. And then I, I have absolutely no no problem whatsoever with that. I think that's perfect. Uh, <laughs> I again, like you mentioned, Don Duck, John Duckett, that uh, um, had a different technique for or was doing more aggressive mobilization. You guys know PP Sally really well. I think those who train with him, um, and then even Tony Curry, we learn to do a more aggressive glands mobilization. So, and I think if you look at some of my previous publications or even PPs, uh, Glenn's dehiscence was not our most common complication, has, has been fistula um, or uh, some other type of uh, issues, but uh, maybe meiotic stenosis uh, likely or some skin problems. So um, I find that again, we, we haven't been able to, uh, to separate that like you, you mentioned. I think we're trying to look if uh, giving um, this intervention, testosterone, will change the outcome for the better. And um, again, from, from this standpoint, we haven't been able to. I heard that now that um, they have this prospective database at CHOP, they are trying to look into, as they acquire more patients, they are looking at the second step from their paper was to look into a uh, relationship of testosterone versus uh, the, the hypospadias outcomes, the complications. So let, let's wait and see. Um, I can, in our database, look back, but it doesn't seem to, and maybe I'll change my, my personal bias to change and then stop using like you guys did it. I, I don't think testosterone is going to make my outcome better. I do not believe that, but I still feel comfortable uh, having this perceived subjective benefits of testosterone and uh, um, that I have... Um, I, I, I believe that I helped doing the, the, the case for the operation, but I, may, maybe not. And then uh, once we have more uh, data and evidence coming through, then that's how things uh, were get, get changed. How long have you been doing the trial that you mentioned that you were still accumulating patients? Well, so I, I thought that uh, um, the main thing is what, what, uh, what got um, in the way is that uh, um, as we stop doing proximal tips, yeah. then, then the cases that are now we do tip repair are like mid shafts or distal hypospadias, basically, I think. Right. And uh, so this is something that, uh, um, like you mentioned, same surgeon, same technique. So the numbers actually reduce. And then to have that uh, large effect, you need the more severe cases. When yeah. that we, that we shrink the cases to very similar categories, I, I, again, uh, our complication rate is low. So it gets very hard to, to see a difference from one of these outcomes, like, you know, wh whatever it is, if it's the anesthesia block, or if it is like one layer or two layer urethroplasty, or if it's a suture type, or even the testosterone. So uh, that's why I believe that uh, maybe not even through randomized trials, but if you have people making research collaboration, I think that's the way, or, the only way to answer it would be like a, in a clinic or a service that is dedicated to hypospadias like yours with huge volume. I, I believe in, in, a, in a few years, you can get that. But um, so I have been doing it to answer probably uh, seven, eight years now. We, we got a delayed significant impact with COVID. Uh, one of the few surgeries that we couldn't do was hypospadias. The rest, they were very, very um, okay with us doing like you no know, kidney surgery, reimplants, mitrofenovs. Uh, hernias, orchidopexis, but not hypospadias, which I, I also find that, uh, um, yeah, it's not not fair for those patients, right? Because it can be, it can be life changing. I, I don't know if it's life threatening, sure. but it's life changing. So for I don't sure know where you draw the line. So it does bring up um, another 
point that um, our um, questioner asked about whether the glands diameter changes with testosterone. Clearly that's been shown in multiple studies that for most boys who are getting testosterone, whether it's um, gels or creams or, inter or parentally, the glands diameter usually does increase. So it's really interesting though, if you look at the natural history of glands diameter size, what you find is that when boys have their little mini puberty between zero and three months, there is a distinct increase in glands width. But then if you follow along boys who don't get any other testosterone, the glands width actually does not change until when boys start their own natural puberty. So you wanna wait for the natural surge that happens in zero to three month ages. But if you wanna keep waiting for the glands to grow otherwise, you have to wait till you puberty. either give testosterone or until they hit puberty and get their own testosterone. That's a little different than penis length, which will increase from the age of three months. It increases a lot during that zero to three month mark. And then it increases very slowly, but it does increase between three months and you know 10 years of age. So it's kind of interesting that there's a little bit of uncoupling between glands diameter and penis length. That also kind of brings a, another point that um, Dr. Braga brought up about how much more difficult skin can be in an eight-year-old um, versus in an eight-month-old because the penis has grown and a low meatus plus any curvature will have more skin deficiency along the ventral surface because their penis is longer. So there's lots of things that you have to take into consideration with, with you know, talk about hypospadias repair when it comes to skin coverage, how old they are, what size their penis is, but at least glands diameter is, is something that's very easy to measure. It doesn't change much in all of that prepubertal, you know, age range that we're interested in. Um, and then there's another question that, that I think we've touched upon the answer. Do we prefer one stage surgeries for proximal types versus more than one stage surgery? Um, Luis, you, you mentioned this, that you hardly ever do proximal tips anymore. And I can say that for many years now, we hardly ever do proximal tips anymore. And that's because we, I think all of us panelists here believe that you should not be doing a one-step repair for boys who have significant curvature, which is the vast majority of patients with proximal hypospadias. And even a significant chunk of boys with distal hypospadias who will have curvature more than 30 degrees. Yeah, that's been covered in earlier master classes. So, you know, you can go to YouTube if, if you're wondering about that. You can go to YouTube and look at the discussions that we had on both distal and proximal, and, you know, when to do a single stage versus a multiple stage. And then, I, I'm just going to predict that, you know, with all the fact, all the confounders that come into <laughs> making these observations that if we could look 10 years into the future, we'll still be having these same questions, unfortunately. And, and then, no, uh, Nicole, um, yeah, thank you for, uh, I totally agree. But one thing just to add, tag along what you just mentioned, um, this paper that I, I, I forgot to mention from Iran, so I'll, I'll just uh, give them the credit properly because I'll try to spell the author's name. Um, the, the last name is Moham Madipur uh, Ahmad. Uh, so this was published in the Journal of Pediatric Urology 2021. And um, I just mentioned that he um, analyzed also the, the, the size or the ratio of the glands versus the ratio of the shaft. And that's one important uh, thing that I think PPE has been talking about this for many, many years. Because uh, a lot of people uh, we saw from the systematic reviews and the studies saying, oh, we give testosterone to small glands, penis. But it's not only the glands. Sometimes you have to see because some patients have a, a huge penis with a small glands. I think the ratio may be more important. And one thing that I, I haven't thought about it that is brought up by this uh, paper, uh, this study from Iran, is that um, they observed because they measured the shaft of the penis that with testosterone, the shaft got the corpora got bigger and actually was harder to actually bring the glands around the corpora. <laughs> so, yeah. so it's the opposite. Uh, what <laughs> so wow. it's very interesting that uh, 
you yeah. think you're making the glands bigger and making it easier, but you're increasing the size of the tube in between. Like imagine a hot dog that the sausage was too big. Then you can't put the bread around. And then uh, that's what they are mentioned that uh, uh, testosterone was not useful uh, to them. So there are so many questions, but I thought that this was interesting to bring another yeah. detail that people haven't looked into uh, observations. Like uh, Warren mentioned that you don't need to do the, just the RCT, but uh, uh, observations is the base for um, evidence-based practice, I, I believe. There's so many fascinating questions, really, when it comes to any sort of hormonal milieu and testosterone. You know, what, what's the difference between testosterone versus dihydrotestosterone? We've not even seen that data in terms of gland size, shaft size, you know, outcomes or things along those lines. And, and could those be different? Well, if you look at the burn literature and animal models, it actually could be quite different where um, testosterone may have one sort of influence on all of the inflammatory changes that happen with wound healing versus dihydrotestosterone, which can have a different impact on all of those inflammatory changes. And does increased inflammation impair wound healing or does it improve wound healing? I mean, these are kind of basic facts when it comes to surgery, but our knowledge of all of it is so tiny in the whole scale of things. Most studies show that estrogen probably helps with wound healing. And so I've been waiting with bated breath for the group in France to tell us about their data. I think they were actually using estrogen and hypospadias patients with this thought in mind. And, and I heard verbally that they were seeing some growth in penis size um, from the use of estrogen, but I, I've not seen any published data. Maybe I'm not looking in the right spots for it, but, but I'm really curious about that aspect. And then that doesn't even bring in the progesterone that moms are now getting with increased, um, we see it quite a lot more, at least here in the United States, um, prenatal pro progesterone that's given in that first trimester or sometimes later, sometimes to very, very high degrees. And does that have an impact on wound healing that may take place months and months down the road? So there's, I think, a huge wide open area for just thinking about wound healing, looking at inflammatory markers, looking at, you know, proxies for for stuff in terms of size measurements, thickness measurements, et cetera. So I hope that for those of you who, who are interested in this topic and have a strong belief one way or the other, if, if, if you're using it, if you're not, just try to think about some of these interesting questions that maybe we've stimulated today and, and just plain observational studies will give us more information than what currently is out there. So we've ended this with she and I saying the reasons why we quit, we used a lot of testosterone and then we stopped and we haven't used any since. And Luis has gone a different pathway and has grouped out some patients that he believes benefit from the testosterone therapy. So that's kind of where we're going to leave it for today and, and thank Dr. Braga again for bringing this information to us and, and, and giving a broader spectrum than you would have gotten just listening to us. Uh, we'll plan on another master class down the road talking about failed hypospadia surgery. And uh, so be watching for that. We'll give an announcement. Thanks for joining Thanks, us, everyone. Thanks so much. Take care. Thanks, Warren. Thanks, uh, Thank you so much.